you know, I got the gig with, with Frank Zappa um, just, just out of the clear blue sky because they were branching out looking for people all over the states. So found out I had to do this cattle call audition, fly myself down to L.A. And I was on unemployment at the time and, you know, was kind of skittish about the whole thing. And I'd never heard any of Frank's music. You know, I'd heard about brown shoes don't make it, stuff like that. But I uh, had no idea. And I thought, well, you know, I can play all the McLaughlin, Billy Cobham stuff, so I'll, I'll smoke it, you know. And I bought two of his records, Live at the Roxy and Elsewhere, and a pro, uh, Apostrophe, three days before the audition, and didn't sleep for three days, because the records just scared me to death. I'd never heard... I mean, the sheer volume of memorization was frightening. Then there was the, you know, the, the level of players was... I, I thought, well, what could I do compared to what Ralph Humphreys and... Uh, and um, Chester Thompson are doing, exchanging these furious drum solos. And then um, the music was really, really difficult at times. And, uh, you know, I was completely overwhelmed by it all. And uh, so I was weak and nervous and, you know, finally fell asleep on the plane as I flew to L.A. And I had to take a bus to Hollywood and then a taxi to his big rehearsal studio and I walked in and I, I was a little green jazz drummer from San Francisco. I'd never seen like anything like in that studio. It was, you know, big huge stage, the most difficult music I'd ever seen spread out all over the stage. There was uh, sound and lighting equipment and anvil cases. I'd never seen an anvil case, you know. And, uh, there were two huge octoplus drum sets and one drummer would, uh, audi would audition while the other drummer set up the, the other kit while the other guy auditioned, so they were kind of just to save time going back and forth, and they were dropping like flies, you know. And Zappa was there with George Duke and um, uh, Tom Fowler, and he was just, nope, uh uh, next, sorry, forget it, you know. And, and I thought, you know, there's no way I'm going to get this gig, and uh, I thought, well, okay, I owe it to myself to try. And so, um, I got up there and uh, I just did the best I could uh, with my audition, which consisted of reading a difficult piece of music called Approximate that had, you know, odd times, odd superimposed rhythms, and it was written up and down the staff melodically, but you were to approximate the melodic curve. You didn't have to play specific pitches, and the idea was everybody would play the same curve up and down, but you could make up your own notes and the rhythms were precise. So, you know, when I'd come to a 13 tuplet, I'd stop and go, okay, and I'd play it for him slowly and prove to him that I understood it even though I couldn't sight read it. And so he accepted that and I got my way through that and then he tested my memorization. He just said, okay, this is a string of fives and then there's a nine and an 11 and this and that and then it goes back to the fives. That's the structure, go. And so we started to play this weird piece and I did the best I could at that. It's something in 19, you know, like a Billy Cobham 4-4 four, four plus 316 thing. And that I was somewhat familiar with, so I just, you know, got, got through that. And then he heard me, wanted to hear me play a blues shuffle to check my feel out. And uh, at the end of my audition, he said, uh, I like the way you play and I want to hear you again after I check out the rest of these guys. And he turns to his road manager, who turns to the other drummers. They start shaking their heads, and the road manager turns back to Frank and says, that's it, Frank, nobody else wants to audition after Terry. And so Zappa turns to me and goes, looks like you got the gig. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so I was shocked, and I said, are you sure I can do this? Because I really didn't think I was good enough. And uh, he said, well, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I just don't know that, you know, I'm heavy enough. And, and uh, he said, well, if you're willing to work hard, you know, I think, you know, you can do it. So, like a good father, he kind of took me under his wing and, and um, and same thing when I left him, you know, like a good father, he said, step into my office and said, I think it's time for you to go out and do your own thing. And he sensed, I guess, my, you know, my feeling for wanting to move on. And uh, I said the same thing to him, are you sure I can do this? And he said, yeah, you know, I think you're ready to, so like a good father, he kicked me out of the nest and said, learn to fly on your own, you know. Nobody would know who I am or care who I am if, uh, if it wasn't for, for Frank. I pretty much owe everything to him, you know. I, I mean, I, I, I take credit for, you know, basically what I, what I do, what I've done, what I practice, and, and what I try to accomplish. But on the other hand, uh, th there's a lot of great drummers that, uh, that don't get a break uh, playing with, with somebody like Frank. When, you know, um, when someone played with Miles Davis, they were immediately known all over the world. If somebody played with Frank, you were immediately known all over the world. You were, you know, you became 
famous and, and you had uh, you know credibility that that you'd get only from playing with Frank because people knew that you had to be able to read and play all this complicated stuff as well as do rock and roll or jazz or a variety of styles so uh, a lot of those gigs don't exist anymore and uh, I was very lucky to have uh, you know worked with him and the black page uh, one day I, I walked into a rehearsal, and I guess this was two years into playing with Frank, so I was fairly comfortable with him at the time. And um, I had done his orchestral music, which was pretty difficult, and uh, I considered myself a vet, you know, at that point. And uh, he walked in and he handed me this piece of music, uh, and uh, he said, what do you think about this, Bozio? And I said, wow, you know, I'm impressed. And this was a through-composed piece of drum music for my drum kit at the time. And it was written with very difficult rhythms, melodically up and down. Every note was written, every tom, every rhythm, every buzz roll, every flan, and what instruments were to be played where and when. So uh, I s could sight read parts of it, but uh, it wasn't a pressuresome thing. He, he just said, uh, you know, check it out. And I said, you know, yeah, you know, this is, this is cool. So I, I kind of chipped away at it uh, for maybe 15 or 20 minutes a day before rehearsals for a week or so and after a week I could play it for him and so I played it for him and he said great and, and he took the drum part back and he wrote the rest of the music and uh, uh, you know the harmony and the melody to it and then we began playing it as a band and um, it's uh, one of these pieces I've, I've become famous for just because Frank wrote it and it's a really difficult uh, piece of drum music at any rate I, I uh, you know once again got this huge uh, sort of cult you know, following from from having played this difficult piece of music that that Frank wrote, you know, and I was just the first guy that uh, that that played it. And, uh...